Is that like a little Death Star type microphone right there? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> it's one of these, uh, one of these blues. Oh, it's old. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Mitch has got one. He his is all like chrome. Uh, <laughs> yikes! I like sh- awesome. I like shiny things. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yeah, you familiar with the uh, movie The Secret of Nim? Oh, okay, yeah, it's an old movie. When I like, I was a little little kid when I saw it, but it had Dom DeLuise and he was this crow, and it was about these. Uh, it was about Nim and these mice that were kind of like a pinky in the brain thing, but they were they were smart, but they also experimented on rats, and the rats were the villains in the story, and so it was all about like them with this special. Um, medallion or whatever that gave the mice a specific, I don't know, power to move stuff with their minds and all that. And uh, but she met the crow and he was all like sparkly, Miss Beards B, you have a sparkly, and he was just easily distracted <laughs> by anything shiny because that was a, he was a crow. <laughs> it sounds like Precious from uh, yeah. uh, what's his name? Uh, what's that Lord, guy? Lord, uh, Lord of the Rings, yeah, yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord of the Rings, Precious yeah. Type. Trans Ams and Burt Reynolds, Elephants and Dom DeLuise. Welcome Dom to the Nerd Brand Podcast. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how that just kind of like like went all different directions, right? But cool, man. I'm ready. Ready to kick some blood. <laughs> uh, today, we're going to let you have the floor, sir, for a little bit to introduce yourself, who you are, what you're promoting, uh, and then we're going to get into talking about personal branding and how to find your style. So, Joey, floor is yours. Awesome. All right. So uh, name's Joey Kilrain. Been doing this kind of work since, let's say, mid-90s. I got really fortunate as a little guy, uh, was always adapted or uh, attracted to uh, like art. Like I did a lot of graffiti when I was younger. Uh, But my dad was always mechanically inclined. Most of my dad's side of family was. And somehow I took those two and was able to add some code in the middle of all that stuff and got very nerdy with things. Uh, When I first started doing this kind of work, uh, God, back in the 90s, or actually, we'll just talk about New York, because when I moved to New York, the uh, biggest job I had when I was right out of college was I was working on Viagra before the world knew what Viagra was. And a 22-year-old guy looking at this and thinking, who needs this? Like, I like, (laughs) But again, you're 22. You don't have any of those challenges, right? And then, of course, working with these guys um, at, uh, at this agency, they were amazing with their uh, comedy. Like who's going to be the spokesperson, Magic Johnson, Joe Cocker, Neil Armstrong. Like it just was like nonstop stuff that they were throwing at it. But I learned so much from those guys because they just kept it humorous the entire time. Because if you don't keep the humor involved, things get dreary pretty quickly. Nonstop deadlines, everybody's stressed. We really don't know what we're doing, but we're going to go in anyway. And yeah, like what a better way to do it, but then to keep a smile on your face. But through all that stuff, <clears throat> I'd always had this inkling with style and like, what is style? And when you're younger, yeah, that's like your, your big thing. Like you, like if you're that confident in yourself, you want to stand apart from others, but you find that we're all very similar. And another thing that I realized very early in life is that my style is a bit plagiarized from others because I'm aspired by other people. Andy Warhol, huge impact on me. Keith Haring. As a matter of fact, Keith Haring had done a illustration or a mural in South Philly. And it's in the uh, video with Bruce Springsteen talking about Philadelphia. He actually walks past it. I used to play basketball there with Rashid Wallace, which oh, is yeah. really dating myself. And I remember Rashid being like this little guy. I'm like, who is this dude? Next year, I'm driving by on my banana bike. And I see this guy like just manhandling people in the corner. I'm like, yo, who's that guy like flying from one end to the other, like doing these massive dunks. And it was Rashid Wallace. And I had the chance to like swat him a few times. And like, I appreciate that I had that chance, but but my point is like having like all these different people that were inspiring me before I even knew it were coming into play. However, as I was trying to identify my style, I realized that there were just like all these projects that were coming at me and all these projects required me to just kind of think different ways. And what started off as an illustration for a magazine quickly became what I have. 
and uh, the illustrations that were up on the LinkedIn posts uh, with like finding your style, it started off with just basic sketches. That was it. And my style was, again, it was a little bit of Keith Haring, uh, Kenny Scharf, a little bit of Andy Warhol, probably throw Picasso or Dali in there. And, uh, or, um, uh, God, uh, the guy for Marvel Comics, uh, Todd, um, McFarland, uh, McFarland, McFar yes. Oh my God, yes, Tom McFarland. Because I love this comic book style, and when I first saw his Spider Man, where he had the spider somewhere hidden in all of the illustrations, I thought, Yo, that's next level. Yeah, that's next level. Like, who who thought of that? And I was like, in Philly, in South Philly, like looking at this stuff like as a total nerd, and like the mafioso guys, like, what's wrong with you? Like, you're supposed to be beating people up, like in. <laughs> no, did you see what what this is going on over here? So it was amazing to see that, and that absolutely influenced me as a designer. Knowing that, I quickly got into uh, like drawings and you know again the graffiti stuff with Espo and seeing or Lady Pink was another person who influenced me. But getting into the real world, yeah, you kind of panic like you know what's my what's my voice? Where's my style? How do I stand out from all these juggernauts? And it's it's overwhelming. And while they were nice people to talk to, you still have your own insecurity. Like, how do I step out of that? And that's where I kind of let my freestyle flow freely. And I just was like, you know, dude, there you go. There it is. And I, I accepted people's constructive criticism. I wasn't people's punching bags, meaning like, you're not just going to say it sucks and try to make me feel bad. Cause trust me, that's what I got plenty of that, that I deal with already. <laughs> but what I got with my stuff here is yeah. Like, you know, tell me why it's not working. Tell me what's wrong with it. And then, yeah, like this project that I did with Judy Law for a magazine that was back in the 90s started off as a silly little bean head. And when she said that word, it looks like a bean head. That was it. It was over. And mm -hmm. from there, I started to evolve this style where it was like the heads were shaped like a bean. I don't know why I did that. I think that's part of the the amazing part of being creative is that things happen. You don't realize why, but then you yeah, just the accidents. like, yeah, happy accidents. Exactly. And I'll, I'll also say a total side note. I did it with pen and paper. And and I say that because I had the wonderful chance of studying and working with Milton Glaser. And Milton made an amazing statement to me once. He had said the reason why he doesn't like computers is that it crystallizes the idea too quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you want Times New Roman, if you type it out, boom, Times New Roman. But if you try to draw Times New Roman, you may end up with Clarendon. Or you may mm -hmm. end up with uh, Georgia or like a different font. And funny, say Oof. Georgia with you guys, right? Uh, but yeah, like bringing that up, like it, all those serif typefaces, you're not like you're, now you just see times, you don't see the other ones. And that super resonated with me uh, with that. And yeah, so a lot of the ideas were done via drawing and that bean head came out of pencil and paper, which I still have amazingly, uh, but I had that stuff. And from there, it slowly started to evolve. And how it had evolved was basically trying to get the head where it had multiple faces. And the problem was uh, I was initially just doing a nose and just like this bean shape type thing. But then I realized, well, I can't make human eyes because that's gonna look kind of weird. I can't put the two together. And then I started thinking of eyes as the window to the soul. And I started thinking, well, there's sometimes where the eyes are kind of nutty. And there's other times that look kind of upset. And then there's eyes where you have like you're in love. And then there's times where you're sick. And then I started realizing I could use iconography to define the eyes. So you have like the heart in the eye, or you could have mm -hmm. like, uh, like for St. Patty's Day, everybody had shamrocks in their eyes. Why? Because it's St. Patty's Day. But I started to really like explore that with those heads. And I realized, yeah, this is kind of fun. And that lasted for, I'd say maybe a year. Right. And for me, and, and I didn't realize this then, but my beautiful best friend, the wife, the boss, she had made a statement about keeping people guessing. Mm -hmm. And I love that because the guessing part is where you don't know what that person is going to come out with next. It's kind of like either Madonna, Michael Jackson or, or Run DMC or, or any of these like musical artists where they combine with other people. Uh, and they do something like, whoa, I didn't even think of that. It's amazing. And that had always been in my head as well. Like, I can I can just collaborate with whoever. I don't care. Like, yo, I'm down to earth, dude. I don't, you know, you can be in Martha's Vineyard or you can be somewhere down in Grimsley, Tennessee. Let's go, Bo. You know, you want to make this happen? Don't care. Let's go. And with that said, I started thinking of the word head 
and I'm not sure why. And again, this is nothing about President Bush, uh, but I was watching this show, uh, TV show, and he was talking about something. I don't even remember what it was. And I just thought, cokehead. <laughs> nope. I don't, I don't, crazy, crazy. There is no yeah, rhyme or reason. A lot, yeah, a lot of people were probably thinking that too yeah. every time they get on. <laughs> yeah, but it's TV. not to dismiss the guy. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely not to dismiss him, right? Like for me, the politics stuff is like, yeah, I know how I lean. I lean, let's make it work for everybody and meet me halfway. That's how I lean, whether you're Republican or Democrat, just try to meet me in the middle, dude. That's all I'm asking for. But with that said, unfortunately, he came to mind with Cokehead and I thought, oh my God, that's an amazing idea. And I just did a painting of a Coke bottle on the shoulders of some buttoned up suit guy. And then the background were two Pepsi cans. And I thought, oh, this is kind of fun. And I'll send you guys pictures of it to show you what it was. And at that moment, I realized I had something huge. Yeah, send me, uh, send me pictures of that. And then yeah. on the video version of this uh, for the vodcast for YouTube. Yeah, I'll, you could put I'll, that I'll, in. Yeah, I'll put that in. Yeah, because at that point, not only did I have that, but I realized my catchphrase, I want it all, can sample what Todd McFarlane did with the spider. I'm going to put that phrase somewhere in there or like find Waldo, right? Like I'm going to put that phrase somewhere in there. And all of a sudden I was like, yo, this is amazing. And then on the flip side of the paintings, I was looking for different passages. Like I was sampling like quotes from like the Quran or the Bible or like just uh, like, or uh, Bill Gates, uh, you know, you find the laziest person to get the work done. And that's how you find how to simplify your process. Like I just started writing all this stuff on the back of it, but the head part of it, I then started looking at, well, what are the other ways you can use the word head? There's obviously, uh, you know, S-H-I-T head. There is, you know, what head? Or Richard head, you know, uh, there is yeah. a dead head, there's knucklehead. And then I was like, I was totally enthralled in what I had. Now, I was doing these as paintings. And the problem was I was running out of wall space very quickly. So then I stopped, because then I realized people weren't going to, they weren't buying the paintings as much, because that head, a lot of them were derogatory, meaning like, Richard head, you're not going to hang that up on your wall. Right? Yeah. You know, you may send that as a picture to somebody you don't like, but you ain't going to put that up on your wall. So with that, I stopped cold turkey, did maybe nine or 10 paintings. I saw, and then I started doing the paintings where the bean had sort of evolved into like a little bit more facial stuff. But the head thing didn't uh, it didn't go any further and it sat there. And now fast forward 10 years later and here I am. uh you know, wanted to get back to an illustration work. And I thought, yeah, this could be a lot of fun, right? But what am I going to do? Am I going to do paintings? And I've got two kids and, you know, my daughter, she's an absolute maniac. So they'll be paint all over the place. So how am I going to get this done? And a student had said to me, why don't you try the iPad? And I thought, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, not my thing. And I like to do it traditionally, I like to draw all my stuff out, whatever. And she said, give it a shot. And her name is Hava Weisberg. And I thought, okay, now, uh, a little side note, I obviously am very nerdy and I'm very technical and I can be extremely picky about my stuff. And when I got the iPad and I started playing around with Procreate, I thought, nope, because Procreate is a pixel based application. And I don't like the fact that I can't scale it. I'm a vector guy. I like the right. ability to scale it large and small. And that was not the program I was going to use. And I fumbled maybe a month or so through different applications. And I fell in love with a product called Concept App. And, uh, it's all vector based and it was extremely intuitive. As a matter of fact, I even did another article on Adobe's draw program, which I thought was a far cry from Adobe Illustrator. And I thought there's no way I'm going to use this. So it became Concepts App. <clears throat> and once I had the app down, I started to redraw the heads that I had already painted. And I obviously paid homage to Cokehead. That was the first one I went after. I wanted to do that. But as I was doing that, I realized what about these other heads? And at the time, I only had like, 15 heads. And there were a few that I just felt really bad about doing. Uh, and those were ones that were derogatory. Now, something like skinhead, not going to do skinhead. Not at all. One, what does that even look like? But two, no, because it gets into a whole different thing. I'm not going to oh, get into yeah. that. Yeah. And then there's other derogatory 
terms. Like they talk to uh, people from India and I don't want to say them, but you know, people from India, people from South America, people from Vietnam, they have like these different names that they use for heads. And I thought, no, I can't do that either. So that's what got me thinking of this flow and what's the checklist to doing a head. So the first thing I had to do was, all right, well, I can't just make up a head. It's got to be relevant somewhere. So I used the Merriam-Webster dictionary and the Urban Dictionary to help me identify different heads. Once I got that down, the second part is if it's derogatory of a race, a culture, or a sex, I'm not going to do it because then it that could be used negatively against other people. And I'm absolutely not being a part of that. But something like Richard Head transcends everyone. I don't care if you're a president, if you're a priest, or if you're a janitor or a CEO, yo, anybody can be that. And I thought that's an easy way to go. Or SHIT head, that's another good one. That doesn't mean you're a particular race or culture. It just means your personality is terrible, right? So that gave me carte blanche to go after ones that are a bit on the racy side, but didn't get into talking about a specific culture. And then from there, the next step was, well, how do I, how do I create this? Like, you know, how do I go about it? So as I started going through this process, I realized, yeah, now I have a very safe way to find heads and not feel bad about which ones I create. And then of course, with the internet being as wonderful as it is and Reddit, I have like nearly 700 ways the word head is used. And I started going after every one of them. So, and not only that, but <clears throat> this process uh, educated me to groups like uh, metalheads, like uh, we have um, Motorhead. And I was like, yo, this guy from Philly, I never heard nothing about no Motorhead. I never heard about Buckethead. And it was stuff that I was like, wow, it's like there's all these other dudes and you start to see their craft. And I started to realize, yeah, it's amazing how these other guys do their stuff, but it would never be in the world of South Philly. Like it's freestyle music. You got some hip hop, all that. You ain't thinking nothing about no motorhead, especially their, their visual, which when I saw the motorhead visual, I thought, yo, that's such an intimidating thing. And I, and I did motorhead paying homage to Lemmy. And I thought, yeah, let me, let me do this up. So then I started creating all these heads and it became awesome because now I have like this wide range of heads. Some of them are jokes like um, uh, turtle head. You guys know what turtle head is? You ever hear that? Mm -mm. All right, it's, it's definitely on the gross side. Uh, the, what's the audience that we have here? Is it PG? Is it uh, R? Uh, we try to keep it PG because of Apple okay. iTunes mostly. Okay, cool, cool. So go look up what Turtlehead means as a, as a definition. And I did Turtlehead. I did the illustration. Let me see if I can find it really quickly. And this one you guys are going to absolutely love because Turtlehead is the Cecil Tortoise from Bugs <laughs> Bunny. And I did these stickers based on, and I started pacing them around, like, you know, Blockhead. Blockhead's a really funny one, but who do you think of with Blockhead? Charlie Brown. <laughs> and I did it homage his shirt and his head, uh, Charlie Brown. And then there's like candies that are named after that. Like you have Orange Head or Lemon Head, different candies that they did. And I just went ballistic with all this stuff and started to create all these different heads, which now I'm about a hundred different heads. And each one of these heads, by the way, still has the phrase, I want it all somewhere hidden in it. So uh, regardless of what size you get the illustration, it, it'll, it might be small, obviously, because the point here, point size here is probably like one point. So you may need a, right. you may need to press your face against a sticker to find it. But uh, the actual full size, the eight and a half by 11 that I've been creating. Yeah. You, you, if you look, you'll find them in there. And, and it's been wonderful. Like there's been people that we started putting them on shirts because people like that, uh, the stickers are like hotcakes. So people just grab them and, and do their thing. And uh, yeah. And, and that's how I found the style. I mean, it, it, it only took well, me you like you know, 20 years to figure it out but uh it happened yeah. overnight it just took me 20 years to, to, yeah. to get it to go i but, uh, uh, i like the, yeah. i like the use of, of things that are subtle for me you know mm. and uh because i it's really easy to kind of like overdo something when you find something and you just start applying it over and over and over again to all the entire design like we're redoing our website right now and we have a nice piece that we feel like fits to create a flow for those that visit the page, kind of go through our processes for, you know, whether it's web marketing, branding, whatever it is. And the inclination is to, cause you like it so well to plaster it everywhere. And so I, yeah, you see Mitch's head just rattling, <laughs> like, you know, I was like, Whoa, like no, a no, bobblehead. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, you gotta, you gotta be, play the subtleties. You don't have to like, 
you know, be just completely everywhere with it. And so that's something that, you know, we're looking at and uh, we're trying to keep, make sure that we don't, you know, do that. But uh, I, I thought it was interesting because you were bringing up all these heads and John actually found something. We do this segment called the brand bit and John actually found something that's going to take probably the three of us back in time <laughs> because something's returning that is like a very much like a mascot. Cause we were talking about mascots this morning. We were toying with the idea with a uh, nerd brand uh, and it, cause you know, we have the glasses and we try to put mm. these kind of in pl- certain places, mm. but John, do you want to like share, give us a bit of a blast of the past? Cause I think all three of us will remember this one from our childhood. <laughs> yeah. I don't personally remember it. So you guys are going to have to give the, the first hand view. Sorry. But uh, and this thing kind of has a weird head for sure. Um, yes. Dominoes, Dominoes. The oh, the Noid. Yeah, I, I thought you were going there. Yeah, yeah. bringing back the Noid, which for those who don't know, was a, a super popular mascot kind of in the 80s and 90s. And um, his whole shtick was that he was introduced to to interfere with Dominoes making their delivery in under 30 minutes. So he was kind of this this antagonist in their story. Um, and so they're bringing him back. They partnered him with a Crash Bandicoot video game or mobile mobile app um and our our, you know i I think he had been in some nintendo video games back in the day right i don't know if you guys played those or not i think i think i think yeah yeah, i think crash is a is a place he's a playstation mostly on playstation yeah he was a video it's a video game yeah definitely definitely but the the noid had presences in video games back in the day too from what i read it was in like the nes like nintendo or something way back in the day but uh Hmm. Yeah, so I don't know. It's kind of just like a, a classic uh, example of brain storytelling, which we talk about a ton. Uh, you know, you've got the this protagonist and this antagonist, and you you enjoy watching the antagonist, and you've you know they've put the brand right as the as a protagonist against this this creature that's trying to to interfere. Uh, and so it's kind of just a a classic example of how a brand can tell a story and then revive it. You know, they're the big thing that they're bringing it back for is they're pushing the uh, the autonomous delivery with the autonomous vehicles. Yeah. Um, and so now they're bringing back the Noid to interfere with that new uh, attempt to deliver pizza. Right. Yeah. So it's a yeah. Cool little when, when, going. when I saw that, I thought, you know, what would be amazing is they did something like uh, the whole Pokemon, uh, you know, f- uh, fanatic uh, where oh. you could show the Noid through your phone and how do you stop him from getting around the autonomous so something like kids would go crazy for that yeah. outside with their parents phones like stop 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 you know like just and again it's it's it doesn't really do anything but it keeps brand engagement yeah right? exactly but that whole yeah like i guess getting to like you know remaining silly remaining fun remembering how things once were they probably not could be the same but revitalizing it into a new medium well, i think yeah, that they've done super well is it, it bridge a it kind of bridges the the age gap, right? You guys are feeling nostalgia with it, and it's something that you've, you've, you know, experienced. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then you've got the new, the new generation of people who are all stuck to their phones. Now they're going to see it in Crash Bandicoot and in the games that they're playing. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? That that there brings up a, a bit of a weird part because I love going to garage sales. I love going to estate sales. I love this stuff, and I actually purchased the top part of a table from a Chuck E. Cheese from like the late seventies. And it was, <laughs> and it was, yeah, but the Chuck E. Cheese, it's amazing to see the style of illustration of him then. And the, the mouse he is now. So the one from back then, he was, he was almost like uh kind of like a rabbit, like someone in Easter co- uh, costume, right? Like, you know, almost like, well, dude, you look like you might be genetic. Let me, you know, what you know, my kids, I would sure as hell don't wait to touch my pizza. Right. But then you got the, the Chuck E. Cheese now is this cute little mouse. And again, it's still like, I don't want mice near my pizza, but so be it. However, that illustration and seeing how it has progressed through the years as different branding companies have got it, it you immediately realize it, but you're like, damn, that looks crazy old. Like there's no <laughs> real brand style guy to it. It looks like Chuck E. Cheese, but it's uh, maybe somewhat tweaked it a little differently where nowadays branding would be all over you. You'd never, 
Yeah. You know, like his nose is too big oh, yeah. or his, his eyes a little crooked. No, but that's not going out. It, it, I had to get it. I thought this is so weird. I don't know. Maybe someone weirder than me will want to buy it for more money. Who knows? So if you know anybody, let me know. But yeah, that whole <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese board and going back to the Noid. Yeah, that was, uh, I, could t- I totally can see that and love that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mascots. mascots in general. It's, uh, there was a, a poll in the article that I read. It's from Ad Age. It, it showed that 79% of Americans enjoy seeing brands as mascots or brands use mascots. So maybe that's something that's coming back. I don't know why it ever really went away. And uh, it's kind of like jingles, you know. Mm-hmm. Everybody had a jingle there for a while, and then they just yeah, kind of yeah. fell out of the marketing tactic. Mm-hmm. Uh, full bell. And it's, it's something that's, you know, they're good opportunities. I think bringing them back, the, the brands that do kind of stand out a lot more. And I'm sure as soon as we start to see some success with it, every brand will, you know, come in and saturate it and what, the trend what, will change. Yeah. What's interesting. What's interesting is that I don't I mean, I don't, Joey, I don't know if you watch any local television, but it, it seems to me like these jingles are popping up a lot in locally produced ads. I, I don't see it a ton in national stuff, but it's local, it's local ads, local, local companies, local brands that are getting back into the jingle game. And I, I mean, I'm kind of like, them, who started this and why? <laughs> what, what was the what was the what was the impetus? And I, I wonder if it's it's a if it's an outgrowth of, you know, local broadcast stations have gotten more into the marketing and advertising side of things to help bring in revenue. They'll tell a client, well, we, you know, we can do your digital ads, we can we can do your website, we can do your video, we can do the whole schmear from here. Oh, and we'll throw in a jingle as an <laughs> kind of as an added probably as yeah. an added come on. So it's it's to me it's just interesting. I, I'm really. I'd be curious to know where the wave started. How did it start and whose idea was it and why? Well, I, I know from like old shows like Buck Rogers and all that, right? Not that I'm that old, right? But they had those interstitials where during the broadcast, they would stick in a little something and you'd hear like a certain voice that reminds you, hey, this is a trusted source. I think where jingles really caught my attention would be with classic cars from back in the day where you would hear like that certain rev up of the engine and then the person talking and there was always a particular um, feedback to that. There was always that surrounding sound where like any car guy hears a Ford fire up, they know Ford. Even if I'm a Chevy guy, I can tell you Ford the minute I hear it, right? Nowadays, I couldn't tell you you know, a, an import from something local. Why? Because they, they really do all sound the same. But I'll definitely hear a 396 thumping down the block and just say, I'll, I'll be the first one at the door. Like, it's the ice cream man. Like, oh, you know, <laughs> where is it? Right? Like, where is it? And then I'm like, oh, God, you know, whatever. But yeah, like those jingles that I saw in, uh, in those old car ads and the like, I think that's where for me, I remember seeing that. And then obviously when you get into the eighties uh, that seemed like everybody was doing that uh, pizza, pizza, like all these different things. Even matter of fact, even when I get into like, um, like what I was saying earlier about with Viagra and all that uh, I think there was some like seriousness to like, yeah, we need a spokesperson that has a bit of a pun to their name with, mm-hmm. with Viagra. And I think that, yeah, like, and you know, Raphael Palmero was somebody they were talking about and then obviously he went on to do the stuff with Rogaine with um uh who is that not Dr. J uh, another basketball player uh drawn a blank anyway uh yeah like they these guys were getting into this stuff but yeah I, I would say like those jingles and all that all kind of became you know people realizing yeah we could take advantage of their voice like you hear James Earl Jones's voice and you think yeah like we I mean obviously our generation knows who he is like Darth Vader and all that but right. uh, others are like who's that guy like you know who's James Earl Jones but those voices yeah like they they really do start to resonate with the brand and they become that person like or even uh Catherine Zeta Jones with T-Mobile mm-hmm. another one you know that's doing that or I I love uh Flo where she was like a nobody and now <laughs> Flo's voice the minute you hear it you know who she is she's you know kind of like multiple personalities now but yeah like it's it's amazing to see how like those jingles and things have pushed brands into spaces they never really thought you know would bring back or garner what they get <clears throat> excuse me the, the insurance industry seems to seems to really love mascots still although they they moved on to human mascots almost mm. if, except for if, geico if, yeah but They're yeah still rocking the guy <laughs> obviously yeah, the but, geico. But, you know, they, 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 they like switch you know they switch their uh their you know, mascots kind of periodically from campaign to campaign and then they have the yeah you know they've got a handful of of ones that come back and you know are in every commercial but you know, you've got State Farm who has 
they had Jake and you got uh, who's the one with chaos or whatever his name is. Oh, mayhem like me. Yeah. Mayhem. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Think all, I think it's all state. Yeah. 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 But it's also the yeah. other guy, that actor uh, who's got a really deep voice. Um, or maybe oh, it's Dennis. It's, it's yeah. Dennis somebody. Yeah. They yeah. Put him I know on. what you're talking about. Yeah. They yeah, put yeah, him yeah. on there as well. And then uh, there was a, the, the thing that I like when talking about jingles and mascots, they brought them both together with the live mascot <laughs> is we are farmers. Bump, da, dum, dum, dum. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. YouTube doesn't like do anything with that and canceling <laughs> us or whatever, but you know, it's got one of my favorite actors in it and it's got that jingle and it's like yeah. done really well. It's funny entertain and those are really entertaining uh with hmm. the farmers commercials or uh, f- think about shack and the general <laughs> that's that i think dude first of all that guy's gigantic it's like he's <laughs> eating people he's huge like in like just this massive guy and you know parts of my family i'm like the runt and i'm like six foot and most of my some of my cousins are like six three i got another cousin at six eleven like they're i don't know what they're eating you know i definitely didn't get none of that meal when i was younger but when you see like people splitting all these different uh or not splitting but going into these different areas you would never expect them uh you know like again like uh shack with the general or just this morning uh totally hysterical someone that i i find absolutely amazing is martha stewart because as when i when i first started learning about martha stewart i was like oof, she does not look like someone i'd want to hang out with well, she wasn't, she was like into espionage. I mean, wasn't she? So all kinds of stuff, but yeah. there was a part of me where, <laughs> and I, and I guess this may speak a little bit about my own self, because I, I think at times you get conditioned to look at certain people and think, oh yeah, they're probably, I'm not probably not going to be cool with them with Martha Stewart and how she, with her branding and was able to like, like salvage, uh, salvage, not salvage, but I think even just reinvent herself uh, mm-hmm. in a group of people that would normally look at her like, oh, you know how she is type thing. Yeah. To me, that's like, God, amazing. Like, you know, <laughs> how could you help me do the same thing? I was just going to say, dude, do you think she has a team of brain strategists who pull it off? Or do you think that's driven primarily by her? I'm just, I have no yeah, idea. That, that's awesome. I, so I've had the chance to work with a lot of uh, different creative people. Like I worked with Alicia Keys for a while. Uh, I did a little bit of work with Tretch uh, and, and then other like celebrities, right? I had that. And they have people that advise them for sure. Just like you guys have your own advice, whether it's t- together or your, your better half or, or even a friend, right? Like someone to give you that. But I, uh, I know in some cases they, they do call their own shot and they say, this is what I'm going to go do. And whether people do or don't like it, uh, they give them advice. But at the end of the day, who is it? Like the people that help me promote my stuff. Yeah. They give me some insight on like, like which heads I should be putting out there. And Hey, like, like the Beatles are coming up, uh, Paul McCartney's birthday. So I'm working on Beetlehead because that's actually a true definition. And a Beetlehead is someone who knows everything about the Beatles, but every mm-hmm. Beatle looks the same except for their face. Who's got glasses, who doesn't. And I'm mimicking it off of, you know, the, those that comprise of, of the Beatles. And that advice was awesome. I wouldn't have thought like, Oh yeah, tie it to their, to their birthday. I right. you know, wouldn't have thought of that. But yeah, I think sometimes there are people who like drive it for the artist or the, you know, the the face, let's say. And then there's others where the artist is like, this is what I'm going to go do. You for your personal brand, Joey, you've <clears throat> you've been able to leverage the pun better than anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, awesome. I, I could say name a couple people I think have done it better, but I appreciate that. Well, I mean, I, I mean, you, 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 the like you said, the, the color portraits that you do, which I saw, mm-hmm. and then and the heads. I mean, mm-hmm. it's all based on sort of on that that kind of pun kind of philosophy. And it, I mean, how does that tie in with your personal brand and the way you the way you think, mm-hmm. the way you you develop ideas? Because because there, cause there's a whole other side of you. Which is the UX UI? If if I can pigeonhole you that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, how does all that work mm-hmm. together? Yeah, that, to put yeah, together to make awesome. your brand. Yeah, that's awesome. And unfortunately, uh, I, if I could figure that out, I will bottle it up and sell it like mayonnaise. Everybody, <laughs> they'll spread it on as much as you can, boy. Here, lather it up. So the problem is, uh, and, and I don't know if it's essentially a problem, but I need counterbalances in order to be who I am. So I can't just do one thing. I get bored really quickly. I love being nerdy, for, first and foremost. And I, I've joked before, I'm, I'm 
I think for some in Philly, I was too nerdy for the thugs, but too thugged out for the nerds. I was in like this weird middle spot. Well, like playing Dungeons and Dragons, but then going and hanging out with such and such because, you know, hey, we're going to go hang out over here tonight. You can't come with us. Right. And now I say that because having gone through my career, I found things that exhilarated me is what I would learn the most from. And in uh, in the drawing and illustration stuff, I've been doing that since a little boy. Uh, I was building cars with my dad or just annoying him. I think it's probably a better way to put it with my dad when he would work on cars. And I brought that forward with me with stuff. But then as I started to get into that, I needed something to pay the bills. And what better than my, des- my life as a designer. So my whole designer side is something that has been like amazing. I, I've just been really, really fortunate. I think a lot of the time is because I just didn't care and I wasn't scared to say hi. I wasn't scared to put myself in a spot where, yeah, I didn't go to Pratt or SVA. I, I'm from Philly. And what do I know about coming from Philly? I'm not scared. You put your pants on the same way I do, bro. Let's go. Let's go make this happen. Right. And what I learned is I don't need to necessarily be your enemy. What I need to do is find out what you can't do that I can. And that's how I started to align with a lot of designers where I realized that they made a lot of emotional decisions, which is okay. You could do that, Mm -hmm. but I'm bringing the science to it and I could be that set of hands that you don't know how it build. I can do that. And I realized there was a flip side because other designers are way more nerdy than I am, but I could be more creative and we can work together. And my goal was to see how many of these people I can work with. <clears throat> but as far as like my, my brand goes, yeah, I've spent a lot of my life trying to keep them separate, but people who know me, how do I separate it? Yeah. It's very hard yeah. to do. I, I don't yeah. think it's really a, really a hundred percent possible to do, but it's funny no. how you brought up how design is, is the, the scientific part of it. I mean, design is, I think when people come to us and they want creative services, they think that, um, you know, we're just like these uh, maybe idea people or whatever, but it's actually a very cold methodical process to do design. Mm-hmm. It's not something that is just, Oh, okay. I got a blank canvas and I just decided it's blue. Yeah. That's not yeah. what we did. You know, yeah, it's yeah, never yeah. what we do. Yeah. It's always the research. Like you just described at the beginning of this podcast, the amount of time you spent just researching head, how to use the word head, how to apply it, how when not to apply it and why it's best not to do it that way and your own personal philosophy as, as a designer and why not to do it that way. And that, that methodical thinking, it's methodical. You have to do that and apply all of those uh, things before you just slap something together and do it because that takes design from becoming artistic and moves it into what's functional and what is going to benefit and work. And that's what's important. That's that's where you start to really start to go from a hobby to more of a uh, profession. Like, I think. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I uh, I had um, the chance to meet uh, Alex Beard, and he's a really well known illustrator. He's actually down in New Orleans, and Alex put it best for me. Uh, I had the chance to hang out with him in a studio in Soho, and it was I did, I'm like, wow, this guy's like amazing. Look at the spot. He's in the middle of Soho. He's got all this room he's got all these paintings and he had said the difference between what like what we do and others is that the world is subjective our goal is to make it objective Uh so as long as you remain subjective Uh yeah as long as you remain subjective with something that means the person who is like yeah the more revered guy or the boss let's say that's a person you have to follow versus no like my objective is to do this so if i put that into a box that's design style is how it looks design is what it does but again it because people don't get that deep and i myself used the word design incorrectly for many years because i just didn't know that design isn't really the look of it it's the function. I mean, the two play play well together. But uh, you know, a great example is if you break a, a car down, the frame, almost a like Chevy and a Ford, unless you know like frame dynamics, or unless you know that the distributor and a Ford is in the front and the Chevy is in the back, it looks the same. It looks the same. And then they just put some style over it, like oh, we're gonna do our fenders this way and our headlights this way. That's style. I'm sure there's some some design to it, but it's it's the style that's going into it. But again, I think there's a lot of people where they stay in this subjective world 
And uh, I mean, yes, you, you need faith just as much as you need science. Uh, faith keeps you going and science tells you, you know, hey, <laughs> here's what's not working. You, you need to correct that or not. <laughs> but yeah, that whole subjective objective thing is where as a designer, I immediately step in with tech. Um, what's the framework do? You know, can it handle it? Uh, or ADA compliance, another really good thing. And I know a lot of designers, they kind of get uh, discouraged by that because they think it puts them in the box. And I tell them, no, I want to be in a box. Put me in the smallest box you can, because now yeah. I'm not going to go build a spaceship when you really just wanted a paper airplane. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> right? just recently with ADA, I mean, John, you found an article with uh, Win Dixie actually winning the against the lawsuit against them for their site not being compliant. ADA is something that I've kept an eye on for a while because ADA and web, it's got its own separate rules, three tiers and ADA in physical locations are completely different. There's really no, I've never found legislation for ADA in the web. Mm -hmm. um, and if there is, they got to start dictating like what tier, tier one, two, three, what is it? That that's what they call tiers, I guess. I can't remember, but you know, it's like, it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't put you in a box. You know, you're, your job as a designer is about the user. So whether the yeah. user is able body like us has a, maybe they're blind, maybe they just have a broken arm and they can't use yeah, the dexterity mouse. challenges. Uh -huh. Yeah. Maybe it's a temporary. I mean, even if it's a temporary disability, it's still a disability and to design something that is friendly to the user, regardless of where that's at on the spectrum, if you will, then it, that's, that's your job as a yeah. designer. So, yeah. and uh, actually a, a big thing that's coming up, sorry for a second, because oh, the big thing that's happening right now is anxiety, anxiety online, because What's everybody's that? online. And if you can't find that button, but it's what's serious about it is, uh, yeah, like I find myself like kind of like hyperventilating <laughs> ventilating because I'm like, oh, snap, I'm trying to get my taxes done. What is yeah. the button? You know, like, da, 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 da. and you're like, you're like, I know I do control F and I start looking like submit, like that's the word I'll put in to try to find it. And I think, wow. If that's me, Uber nerd, I can't imagine my mom, mm -hmm. and you know, doing this kind of stuff. Or, or again, someone with a you know a dexterity challenge or or a vision challenge, right? Uh, matter of fact, even Google is is adding the algorithm that uh, determines your user experience. And if you score low in that, that mm -hmm. affects your page ranking, which I think is absolutely awesome. You know, like oh, yeah. these guys doing this stuff. Like let's let's make it work for everybody, or at least yeah. get close to it. Google's actually, yeah, we give Google a hard time and a good time for both things. Sometimes it's like, ah, oh, you're making things harder for us as advertisers. But at the same time, Google's about users. They don't really care about, you know, what you're trying to rank for and your bots and all that. They're about users because mm -hmm. that's who's, you know, running their bills and paying their bills rather, I guess, you know. So it's kind of like, I appreciate the fact they do that. Get the junk websites off there um, because... People land on a website, you know, it's a trust thing. I've, I've seen many corporate sites that look like phishing sites and it's because they've never applied a design. They think they have because mm. they've shortcutted to buy a commercial theme and yeah, they put their colors and their logo on there, but you still look like a phishing site. Cause I could do that. I could mm -hmm. spin up a site and this is, this is, this actually happened. Do y'all remember a while back? It was a data breach with um, uh, credit. I can't remember the name of the company, but yeah, it's one of the big credit bureaus or whatever. It got busted about like, I don't know, three or four years ago. And then uh, the people were like uh, wanting to know if theirs was, you know, breached or whatever. Somebody spun up a phishing site that was like a dot com, not a dot gov or whatever. <laughs> they started going to that site and then giving the information that was stolen to see if it was stolen. And so, oh, you know. Wow. Yeah, so it was very clever, very, very clever, very nasty and mean. But I mean, that that's why on web, you know, if you've got a poor, if your design and UX is poor, good for Google for busting that because it should stop that and force uh, places to become uh, more user friendly with their websites, making them navigable like they should be, making them ADA compliant. Um, it's kind of overdue. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, it, it's funny, Jason, because I mean, one of the things, one of the uh, Joey, just for your edification, there's things called Mitch's axioms. They're, they're little, you know, little truisms that I tend to spout a lot, but that's because they're true. Hmm. Um, awesome. And one of those is pretty is easy, smart is hard. And yep. pretty is easy because it's subjective. You can do anything you want to make something look good. But I've always said that in marketing and advertising, UX, UI, uh, web development, it's creativity in service of an idea and, and, and to create a machine that creates a bridge between the user and the brand. 
there's a lot of personal stuff in the relationship being developed in order to develop the brand. And that's not going to come out of a contractor or Upwork or whatever you want to use. And as far as templates go, I've been anti-template with WordPress for years. I know WordPress um, themes are templates, but I'm, I'm always talking about commercial themes. Like I've seen places take commercial themes and very few will actually develop a child theme for that commercial theme and then do development, which is fine and is the correct way. However, that parent theme is still a party out there somewhere that made that for the purpose of just making money, not for the purpose of helping you grow your business. And if they just decide one day, eh, I'm done with that one. I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. release a new version. Yeah. Or that marketplace shuts down and doesn't allow them in back anymore because they don't meet certain criteria. Whatever it is, you're, you're tied to that third, fourth party now. You're not tied to who you're working with here like it, with us. And so it's sort of that 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 becomes a, an, an element and a piece in, in the process that no one sees, no one thinks about, because, again, it's all they see the ending. They see the they see the paint on the wall. They don't understand what it took to figure out if that's the right color paint that they actually wanted to match from whatever. You know what I mean? There's there's all those. There's so much science and so much engineering that goes behind developing a brand that no one sees because they all interact with the ending. But yeah, but that, that's a great point because at the end of the day, uh, you need people to understand why you're valued, mm -hmm. right? And I think because again, if you boil it down, we're kind of like artists, right? And artists usually get a bad rep because we're just not looking at as being serious. Yeah. And Star when you start to, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you need to show like, like, yeah, that's not me, dude. I might be starving, but that ain't me. Yeah. That'll do yeah. that. Right. I don't and do I, this for fun. I don't do this for my personal enjoyment. This yeah. is my profession. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and I think for, for a person starting out, because I, I, I work with, uh, I, I mentor a lot of, uh, a lot of young designers and young meaning like some of them are like right out of school, but my sweet spot has been people that have been at it for like three to eight years. Uh -huh. Right. Because yeah, like, what am I doing? I feel like I'm floating. I'm like, all right, well, what do you do every day? What do you wake up just doing work? Is that what you're doing? Okay. I mean, yeah, I do that too, but I also network. I also get around other people and I also focus on how am I talking to people? Like, what am I, well, when you talk to me, let me tell you what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. And to give that insight to them helps them clean up their game. So they're not sounding like a bunch of, you know, artists, like, like just making it pretty. And I think, you know, the whole making it pretty thing, I know that upsets some people uh, about it, but I think it's true. I think as a designer, yeah, they're hiring me to make something look good. Right. But it isn't just making it look good. It's also making it function well. Uh, I, I gave this podcast the other day about what's good customer experience. And I say good customer experience is when the customer comes back. What's great customer experience is when that customer brings their friends. Yeah. I mean, that's to, for, for those listening and, you know, trying to figure out how to develop your brand. Um, it's a, it's, it's a very long process. It's not an easy process. It requires somebody that actually you can sit and talk with, uh, kind of knows the work, knows how to do the work. Um, it is not artistic in scope and style. It's, it's methodical that it, it, it takes time to get to know you. I, and many select, you talk about working with celebrities, many of those celebrities, they didn't just, you know, wake up that morning yawn and go like, I'm going to be this or be like that. Right. I mean, um, I always talk about like we did a podcast a while back on personal branding before and we talk about Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> you mm. want to talk about a brand, a personal a guy that's a personal brand that's become this jargon up business. Um, that's him, you know, and I just I remember him from are you can you smell what the rock is cooking days in the, the WWF. Well, I guess at the time was it the WWF still or but uh, maybe I don't remember if he came in when it was the WWE and they had to rebrand. But uh, yeah, I remember him all the way back, back, back then. And uh, looking at where he's at now, it's like, wow, uh, such a evolution. So, and that's kind of what it's about. Um, that's kind of like what we like to help people do. We like to help take people take a look at their brand and their business, figure out how to make it better, how to make it work better. But through that, um, because anybody can do an ad. We've always said that everything you do is an ad and we operate on the outer, the outer circle operating on that. What will never work. Anybody can do a what. 
but you know, it really takes time and a designer to kind of get to the core of like, why do you want to do this? Why do you get in the bed in the morning? Why do you get out of the bed in the morning and why should they buy from you? And then develop, help you develop that philosophy, that personal style and branding as to like, how is that effective of the why? So we always operate in that why, how, what model, um, golden circle from Simon Sinek. We, I'm pretty open about where it comes from. <laughs> so. yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I get it. If I had to leave any parting words for aspiring designers or people, uh, I think that, you know, yeah, you can go to design school forever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, what got me out of going to design school forever was that I thought it was all the same. Same poop, different toilet. That's what I started thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. Right? It's just a different way. And, yeah. I, and what I got into, I started... Uh, I, I started, I went to the Bronx Community College, started learning how to build motors. And from there, I got an internship. And at the internship, one of the creative directors behind, uh, I think it was Lipitor, actually went to that garage. And he says, did you switch careers? I'm like, no, I'm just doing this as fun. Yeah. And it was really awkward to see him, me dressed in like some mechanic suit versus what I wore when I would go to work with Pfizer. Yeah. Right. But on the flip side to that, the other thing I would totally... Uh, tell aspiring designers is definitely take courses in comedy. As you can tell, I have some experience with that. Uh, but I say that because comedy helps you not only read the room, but it gives you a lot of confidence so that you can see what you're about to get into. It does give you a little bit of an edge because inevitably something's going to malfunction. And how do you play that off without looking like you just screwed up? I know we got, I know we got to go, but I saw the Kentucky plate there. That made me feel really good. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if that, I don't know where I got that one. Did I, I don't know if I got it out of a barn or not. Hopefully, it doesn't it matter. It's there. It makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> the gun in the trunk. <laughs> yeah. There's a, uh, yeah, I got some other pretty cool ones. Uh, there's some that are a bit further up. But you know, that wall, some of those plates, like a couple hundred bucks. Oh, anyway. Yeah. Well, we appreciate having you on the show. Uh, let people know where they can find you, whether on social media, what website, what do you want to plug right now so they can, sure, where they sure. can find you online? So really easy way to find me is just Joey Kilrain. That's it. And it's one L. Uh, I'm not killing anybody. I'm not killing the rain like some of the kids used to joke me back in Philly. So it's Joey Kilrain. If you uh, Instagram, it's uh, Kilrain. Uh, so is Facebook. But uh, likewise with LinkedIn. Uh, it's killrain.com. If you want to see me, uh, my d- digital work is at dead company. That's D E D dot company because digital experience design is far too long to spell. So we just went with dead company, which is a little bit easier to run with. And yeah, like I've, uh, yeah, that's it. That's, that's how you can get me and find me. All right. Well, we appreciate you having you on, uh, the show for all our listeners out there for, uh, go to our YouTube channel, like subscribe, do all that thing. I haven't said that in a while cause I keep forgetting, but, uh, <laughs> we do want to try to get a vanity Earl as why. So we're just, we need to get some more subscribers. So please go out there, do that. Uh, you can find us everywhere on social media at NerdBrand agency. And if you want to listen to this or watch this podcast, go to nerdbrandagency.com slash podcast. And you can watch that, find Joey and follow him and check out his stuff. And uh, appreciate you having on, being on the show, everybody. Have a great weekend. And remember, keep your nerve brand strong.